good to see you all here, and I know that there are many watching online too, so I'm welcome to you, those of you that are remotely watching, and we've got a new gimmick over here, I understand, the 360 camera, so uh, this is one of my um, one of my favorite topics to talk about at Mises U. Uh, there's really just no shortage of material, right? This is like um, whack-a-mole or something. There's always a new objection to deal with, and I've only got a few minutes here, so I can't deal with all of them, and that would take hours and hours to, to handle the objections, uh, serious and silly, that come up to uh, capitalism. But let me, um, let me start off by defining terms a bit. There, there are um, those who object to using the term capitalism, and I, I respect the reasons for it. It's um, perhaps best to think of this as free markets, uh, but I use the term, Mises used the term capitalism. Uh, he talked about the anti-capitalistic mentality, and that's really what we're dealing with here. Um, it is important when you're dealing with people who object to the idea of markets uh, to ask a few questions to figure out what exactly they're, they think they mean by capitalism. Uh, because a lot of times what you find is that they mean crony capitalism. What, what they're talking about is some sort of arrangement where businesses are able to gain advantages through um, uh, restrictions on competition from the state, or they're able to gain privileges, they're able to ignore the side effects of their activities uh, on bystanders, and uh, they're able to, to basically use coercive force via the state to transfer wealth in their direction. That is not what we mean here by capitalism. So we're not talking about crony capitalism where special interest groups are able to manipulate the government to, um, uh, to get what they want at the expense of, of others. So the, the term free markets uh, might be a preferable term in some ways. There's no ambiguity there. We uh, uh, when we say free market, we mean a market that is where people are free to act voluntarily without state coercion. So that sort of groundwork being laid here, let's talk a little bit about the first of five objections that I'll mention. In previous years, I had a presentation with 10, and that's not, I, I didn't shrink it to five because there are fewer, it's just <laughs> there are, if anything, more uh, now, but... Um, uh, I never seem to make it all the way through, so I picked some that I thought would be um, uh, particularly uh, salient here. So first, uh, you, you've heard this sort of saying, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Um, I hear this sometimes from students. It's almost a cliche, um, and yet it's just not true. Um, it, that, that's not what we see happening. Uh, so this is an, an uh, sort of leveled as an indictment against uh, markets, that markets lead to a few elites, the 1% or what have you, that, that will uh, um, uh, rise to the top of the economic system, stepping on the bodies of everyone else who is made poorer by their activities. Now part of this may originate from a kind of a fixed view of wealth, that there's only so much in the world. There's only so many resources. There's only so many uh, goods and services that are produced. And so the basic question in many people's minds is uh, how do we distribute what's available? That is not what markets, not how markets operate. It's not how economies operate. Economies operate by creating new things, innovation and creation so that there is more. And the fundamental question really is one of production, innovation and production. Um, and so you can see this if you look at uh, society, human society, in almost every country um, over the last uh, few decades and, and every country over the last um, century or two, uh, you can find an improvement in the standard of living across the board. Um, today, according to Matt Ridley in his book, The Rational Optimist, of Americans officially designated as poor, um, and by the way, it's important to recognize that an American who falls uh, just below the poverty line would be considered rather wealthy in many countries in the world. So uh, the American definition of poor and other definitions might be widely um, disparate. 
Uh, but of Americans officially designated as poor, 99% have electricity, running water, flush toilets, and a refrigerator. 95% have a television, 88% have a telephone, 71% a car, and 70% air conditioning. Cornelius Vanderbilt had none of these. And, and I think some of these statistics are, are a little dated. Um, I was listening to a podcast on the way here, um, uh, one of Russ Roberts' podcasts, and he was talking to someone who was uh, discussing the homeless population. He's, and the, the uh, interviewee was saying, well, virtually everybody in San Francisco who's homeless has a, has a cell phone. Uh, so this, this, is, this is the product of that innovation and production that the market system generates. One important question to, to think about is, are we discussing inequality here, or are, are we discussing the well-being of the poorest fraction of society? Hayek said, once the rise in the position of the lower classes gathers speed, catering to the rich ceases to be the main source of great gain and gives place to efforts directed towards the needs of the masses. Those forces which at first make inequality self-accentuating thus later tend to diminish it. You can think of a society where inequality is, is substantial, but even the lower levels of that society, economically speaking, are doing very well compared to other countries. And then you can think of countries where um, maybe there's not so much inequality, but uh, there's a, a very high degree of um, of poverty. So do we want more poverty reduction uh, or do we want more inequality reduction? Those two things are not necessarily the same. Now we do see some forces that have um, moved us toward more inequality in some, in some ways in developed countries. One of these is the uh, superstar effect. Uh, we get more specialization, especially as we have an economy where people can trade with those in other parts of the world. So you get an international division of labor, uh, and that increases the superstar effect. When people have a larger market that they can sell to, uh, those individuals who are the best at what they do will tend to do very, very well. So that is um, something that's going to cause uh, a little more inequality as some people have an opportunity to do very well for themselves. Increased immigration can do this. Uh, imagine someone from a very poor country who immigrates into a very wealthy country. Um, even without the well-being of any single individual changing, in fact, even if the immigrants' well-being <clears throat> increases as the, after they immigrate, you can still see an increase in inequality in the destination country. So if someone comes from a country where their per capita income is $1,000 a year and they migrate to the United States and their income, let's say, doubles to $2,000 a year, because you got that $2,000 a year individual in the United States, <clears throat> excuse me, that will tend to increase the inequality in the United States, even though no one is really worse off. So increased immigration can do this. Also, we have uh, matching and, and, and mating kinds of um, uh, issues that come up that tend to increase inequality of households. So today in the United States, uh, high earners tend to marry other high earners with greater frequency than they once did. If you go back several decades, you would find more cases where a high-income earner married a low-income earner, and uh, that would tend to average out household income much more so than you see today. So that, that would tend to uh, increase inequality. Note that these are not really increasing poverty, and that's why it's important to make that distinction between inequality and poverty. Um, there are some other factors that are worth mentioning here, and uh, I'm only going to mention uh, a couple to give you a, a flavor of the kind of thing we're, we're talking about here. But we do see... Um, a reduction in inequality, largely because there is an elevation of the lowest income levels and lowest educational uh, status, as that group tends to improve in their standard of living, uh, you see a reduction in inequality um, there. Uh, IQ scores, um, as Matt Ridley has pointed out, 
um, have uh, the spreads have shrunk, uh, not so much because the people with the highest IQs have lost points, but because those with the lowest IQs have, have gained points over, over time. Uh, British aristocrats uh, were six inches taller than the average height in 1800. Today, they are less than two inches taller. There's differences in nutrition and so forth have made an impact there. Early childhood development uh, has made um, a, a powerful impact. Now, if we're concerned about inequality, and I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be, um, there are some government policies that have actually increased our inequality or at least worked against reductions in inequality. And one of these uh, would be the, the, the wealth transfer kinds of programs that we see. Uh, Tanner and Hughes a few years ago pointed out that welfare can out, outpay work uh, in the United States. Uh, in 35 states uh, of this country, uh, welfare pays more than a minimum wage job. And, of course, you talk to someone who's a, more of a progressive on this, and they'll say, oh, well, the solution to that is to just raise the minimum wage. Well, uh, no, uh, that, that's a good way to render someone unemployed and on welfare, but not typically going to, to help matters. Uh, in 13 states, uh, welfare pays the equivalent of more than $15 an hour. Uh, for many recipients, they say, especially long-term dependents, welfare pays more than the type of entry-level job that a typical welfare recipient can expect to find. Now, the problem is not, well, it is the absolute amount of wealth transferring that's going on, but part of it is the structure of these wealth transfer programs, which tends to create a kind of hurdle that uh, someone in poverty would have to get over in order to gain income of a substantial amount from earnings. And, uh, colleague of mine at Wofford College shared this with me a few years ago. This is a um, rather complicated diagram, so I'll try to uh, summarize this as well as I can, but let's look at the upper, upper diagram here. This is the amount of income a, a person would have from their earnings and also from transfers. So you've got a basically 45 degree line here. Um, axes are not exactly equal in scale, but that if they relied entirely and only on their earnings, then this dark blue line here would show uh, how much income they have. If you factor in the wealth transfer programs that they qualify for at various levels of income, you find, and I'll just skip the light blue lines here, but the, the darker blue of these, um, of these lines here shows what they have after they've been granted a um, uh, benefit from a welfare program and after they pay any taxes they owe on their earnings. So what you see is that um, at low levels of income, their standard of living is going to be considerably higher than their earnings would allow. And at higher levels of income, after we get into the kind of the middle class area here, you'll find that their standard of living is going to be lower than their earnings alone would allow because they're going to be taxed on those earnings. So the slope of this is not as uh, steep as it would be without taxes and wealth transfer programs. You'll notice that um, for certain ranges of income, like right in here, this is very, very flat. That is, if you increase your earnings, your standard of living is not going to go up very much. And that means that there's an implicit tax on your earnings beyond the tax, the income tax that you would pay on them. You're also losing benefits, which of course would be um, a feature of most any um, earnings tested welfare program. If you earn more, then the government's going to say, well, you don't need as much in assistance, so we're going to cut back on the assistance as you earn more. So if I earn another dollar, and because I earn another dollar, I lose about 30 cents of uh, benefits that I had qualified for, then I'm, my behavior is going to be influenced in a way that's very similar to me being taxed 30% of my income. Okay, So if you factor in the actual taxes and then this sort of implicit tax that uh, a welfare recipient would, would um, 
would pay by losing various benefits, then the implicit tax, if you count both of those together, and they, again, they act very, very much the same as far as the behavior of the recipient, then you get a, an implicit tax that's almost 100% for certain income ranges. Notice that for lower incomes, the tax, that is the income tax plus the lost benefits, is in the 20 to 40% range for incomes below about $10,000 a year. Once you hit about $10,000 a year, you start to lose a lot of eligibility for various programs, and so the implicit tax jumps up to around 70% and then up to close to 100%. So this means that if you're a person who's earning about $18,000 a year, and you think, well, maybe if I work harder or get some more training <clears throat> and get a different job and earn more, maybe I'll be better off. Well, not really. You won't be. In fact, for wide ranges of income, the implicit tax is so high that the motivation a person would have to earn more, work harder, work more hours, work smarter, et cetera, is pretty low. So this means that if a person is in this low income level here, range here, and they want to be over here at sort of a middle class lifestyle, they're going to have to make a huge leap in order to get there. They're going to have to face very high implicit taxes. So this means there's a hurdle, as I said earlier, that uh, induces people to remain at these very low incomes once you're past the hurdle, maybe you get some education, develop some skills and so forth, and you're over here, then your implicit tax is much lower. But in order to get there, you've got to do something pretty incredible to get past all these adverse incentives. So this increases inequality. You get people stuck down here, you get people in here, but you don't get very many people at the hurdle itself. Now, Backing up and looking big picture on this, there's a study that's done every year, uh, or every other year, I think it's every year, uh, by the Fraser Institute, and it's called the Economic Freedom of the World uh, Report. And I use this in my, in my macroeconomics classes to, to show the impact of markets on incomes and various measures to the extent that you can measure human well-being, you can measure things like life expectancy. Generally, it's better to live longer than live shorter. Literacy rates, um, uh, access to clean water, and various other things. And so we understand uh, that there are problems with aggregating numbers, but um, I still think these are illustrative of some of the issues here. If you look at the countries. Uh, that are, they rank 158 countries. In the last uh, report they did in 2016, they rank countries by economic freedom levels. And they look at things like uh, how much regulation is there, what are the tax rates, uh, how much corruption is there, uh, what's the legal system like, is it um, a country where the monetary system is stable or do they have a lot of inflation, are people free to exchange currency with, um, to exchange money with other countries. Lots and lots of variables, and so this is a kind of a meta-index of various things that you might, you might think about uh, as relating to economic freedom. So you could think of this as a kind of an, uh, a rough indication of how market-friendly a country is. And they divide the countries up into four quartiles. So you've got the most free, the next most free, the third quartile, and then the lowest or fourth quartile where countries that are the least economically free would be, would be located. What we see is that the countries that are the most economically free, that's the blue here, have the lowest levels of extreme and moderate poverty. 1.9% uh, of the people in those countries, uh, that's about 40 countries, are, have a, a, a state of extreme poverty, and about 2.3% are in moderate poverty. As you can see, if you're in one of the least free economic, uh, or least economically free countries, then the rate of extreme poverty is 30.6%, and moderate poverty rate is 48.1%. If you look at the income share 
And this is looking at more of an inequality measurement. If you're looking at the income share of the poorest 10% in each of these countries, it really doesn't seem to make that much difference. Uh, there's a slight increase here um, for being in one of the most free countries. You get 2.75% of the total income if you're in the bottom 10%. If you're in the least free countries, uh, you average about 2.45%, but really there's not much of a difference. However, 2.45% of a large number, large income, would be a lot more income in absolute terms. So if you look at the income earned by the poorest 10%, if you look at how well off this poorest 10% is, as well as we can measure such things, you find that it's, an, it's tremendously better to be in a country which is more economically free. Now, um, I have uh, a few things to say about um, where the top countries are and where, who the bottom countries are. We'll get to some of that in a little bit. Let me address another um, kind of inequality-based um, uh, concern that people have who are opposed to, to markets, and that is this uh, CEO-to-worker compensation ratio. And you've seen this, this kind of thing before, um, no doubt. Uh, there was a lot of this when the Occupy Wall Street movement was um, in the headlines. And uh, you still see people bringing this up, that the CEO makes X amount of dollars and the, um, uh, the uh, lowest paid workers in the firm are making a lot less. And so there's this giant ratio for some firms. The argument is that somehow this is making the poorer workers or, or lower income workers in the firm worse off because the CEO or whoever it is in upper management is making more. And this is an old fallacy that there's some sort of fixed pot, that the payroll for the firm is a fixed amount of dollars. And so the more you give to this one person, the less there is for somebody else. Uh, that's not the case. In fact, for some co uh, companies, it may be actually the reverse. When you pay a lot of money to attract a CEO, you're, you're paying for the talent that CEO is producing. Uh, for the firm. So if you get a very talented CEO in the firm, it's quite possible that that CEO is improving the performance of the firm and therefore creating better opportunities, higher incomes, and, and uh, uh, other benefits for the lower, less paid workers in that firm. So there's nothing about the firm that says there's a fixed payroll and the more you give to this person, unless they're, you have left over to give somebody else. But there is this kind of concern, um, which you can see, this is um, from the Economic Policy Institute, always a reliable source of misinformation on economics. Uh, and you can see from 1965 going up here to um, about the bursting of the dot-com bubble, um, you see a, a very high CEO to worker ratio up to close to 400 times. Now, one important point here is we're looking at the 350 publicly owned U.S. firms with the largest revenue each year. This is not the average firm by any means. These are very large firms. And you can see this ratio kind of bumping up and down here. And um, uh, lately it's been going up. I don't know what it is uh, this year. But there's something about this you should know. The average size of the very large firms that are in this graph increased in recent years. According to... Um, a study published by the NBER a few years ago, the increase in CEO pay between 1980 and 2003, which you can see from about here to about here, that increase can be fully attributed to the six-fold increase in market capitalization of large U.S. companies during that period. The firms are bigger. The CEO is managing more. It's Shouldn't be surprising if this person is paid more because of the higher level of skill required to administer 
manage these kinds of assets. So um, it just makes sense as the average market capitalization of companies in the S&P 500 increases, the average CEO pay of those firms would also increase. Now, as for the ordinary CEO, we find that their pay is really not very remarkable. Um, if, and this is from uh, a publication from AEI a few years ago. Um, we find chief executives, this is from 2008, chief executives, uh, I'm sorry, 2013. In 2013, chief executives were making about $178,000 a year, um, about the level of a dentist. And people don't look at dentists and say, well, you, you know, you greedy dentist. You know. <laughs> well, maybe they do. I mean, I'm perfectly happy with my dentist, and I, I want my dentist to be happy and well-paid so that when this person's <laughs> yanking at my mouth, they're not angry and disgruntled. <laughs> and doesn't want to cause me any pain. Uh, so this is not really an exceptional um, income. Of course, this is lumping in the, the Bill Gateses of the world with people who are a lot less, um, managing a lot less in terms of assets. Let me turn to the second um, concern that people have about markets and capitalism. And you, you've all seen this before, right? Well, socialism works in Europe. Um, people are happier in Denmark. Uh, so, why can't we adopt that here? Medicine is cheaper in Canada. I mean, I'll talk about health care later in the week, but this is the kind of thing that you hear again and again. Now, here's back to that index that I mentioned earlier. I've got a, a here's the list of the top 30 most free countries in the world out of about 158, I think, that were on the latest index. So the most free, economically free country in the world, Hong Kong, second is Singapore, New Zealand, uh, we have somebody from New Zealand here. There we go. New Zealand. All right, number three. And has been there for quite some time, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, Switzerland, and then a whole bunch tied for fifth. Canada, Georgia, that's not the state one door over. Um, uh, Ireland, Mauritius. I should give extra credit if you can find Mauritius. or um, United Arab Emirates. Um, Australia, we got somebody from Australia here. There we go, two people from Australia here. Uh, UK, um, Qatar, Chile, Jordan, Lith where's the United States? Oh, number 16. Uh, we used to be right up here near New Zealand and um, we, we've dropped in the rankings a good bit in the last few years. Uh, Malta, Armenia, Estonia, Finland, Denmark, etc. All right, now, what I want to point out here is you've got Denmark, which is always brought up as one of these countries where you know they're socialist and they're happy, and therefore we should be socialist, and they, then we'd be happy. Uh, and then you've got the Netherlands, number 25. Now, this is out of 158 or 59 countries. The distance between the Netherlands and the United States, and less between Denmark and the United States, is really not all that great. Um, they're well within the top quartile of economic freedom. The United States is number 16, they're 21 and 25. Now, their socialism works relative to many other countries because they're not very consistent with it. It is diluted with a hefty dose of other freedoms. The United States score, this is a one to 10 score that they're using on this index, is 7.75. The Netherlands, um, and, and the, lower, the, the, the higher the number, the less economic freedom you have. Um, the United States is 7.75. The Netherlands is 7.82. Denmark is 7.72, 0.03 away from the United States. The Netherlands ranks, if, they, if you divide it up into the subcategories of economic freedom, the Netherlands is number nine out of 158 on the legal system and property rights. They're number four on their monetary system. They're number four on the freedom to trade internationally. It's very highly ranked in many categories. Where is it low ranked? Uh, well, 
on the size of government. The size of their government is number 154 out of 150. Actually, I see now it's 159, 158. 154. So they are balancing a very large government with regard to their welfare state and some other things with some important economic freedoms where they rank very high. Denmark is the same way. Denmark is 155 out of 159 countries on the size of government, but they, like the Netherlands, have a number of other important freedoms that help to offset that. So I would say that these countries are prosperous in spite of the size of their government, and they're enjoying the benefits of these other freedoms. By comparison, the United States is number 27 on the on the legal system and property rights, number 40 on our monetary system, and number 60 on our freedom to trade internationally. So we have a smaller government, true, uh, than the Netherlands or, or Denmark, but we, have, we are much lower ranked on some other economic freedoms that are worth mentioning. Uh, incidentally, the top marginal corporate income tax rate is 39.1% in the United States. That's the third highest in the world and the highest among the 34 industrialized OECD countries. In the Netherlands, their corporate tax rate is only 25%. So I think it's a bit inappropriate to say, well, socialism works in the Netherlands and therefore we should copy what they're doing. The socialism looks different, but um, it's really... Uh, not that, uh, not that far apart. Here are the bottom. I think in this case I had about the bottom 31 or 32 countries that are on the list. Uh, <clears throat> just so you can see, <laughs> did I miss something? What was? <laughs> oh, Venezuela. Yes. Well. <laughs> They're not, they're not doing much to improve that ranking last I, I saw either. Um, their inflation rate's very high, um, price controls and everything. And uh, I read a few months ago the average Venezuelans lost like 15 or 20 pounds um, because of the difficulty of getting food. Um, anyway, um, uh, just to give you some perspective, remember I mentioned the United States ranked 7.75, I believe I said, on the ranking. Uh, Venezuela is 3.29. Um, uh, Argentina is 4.81. Ukraine, the lowest ranked European country, is 6.00. Uh, 22 of the bottom 31 countries are African. Georgia Yete, who's uh, 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 an economist from Ghana and a president of the Free Africa Foundation, says um, Africa is poor because she is not free. That is the key. Now, as to this happiness thing, I, I wanted to mention this uh, because it comes up repeatedly. There was a 1974 study by Richard Easterlin which produced something that lasted for a long time in economics and, and other um, disciplines uh, called the Easterlin Paradox. The study seemed to show that the wealthier countries didn't have happier people in them than poorer countries. And so for decades, people are citing this kind of thing. They're saying, well, look, it's, uh, you, can, you can increase your GDP and so forth, but you're not necessarily going to be better off uh, uh, mentally for this. Um, there were two, two 2008 studies that showed this paradox doesn't really exist, that um, to the extent that you can measure happiness, and I think that's extremely problematic, I'm not suggesting that these are, uh, uh, that there's any really good way to do this, but to the extent that they surveyed people and, and tried to figure out how happy are you and so forth, uh, the studies indicated that rich people are happier than poor people. Rich countries have happier people than poor countries. People get happier as they get richer. I mean, pretty much every dimension you want to consider, um, it is better for your well-being to have more um, income. Uh, the earlier study, the Easterland study, simply had samples that were too small to find any significant differences. 
Um, certainly the more recent studies were problematic. The Easterlin study appears to have been even more problematic. This uh, diagram has a series of bubbles uh, corresponding to the populations. So you see China's here, India's here, there's the United States, and uh, there's Denmark right up there. Um, and uh, this shows uh, on the horizontal axis the GDP per capita in 2003 adjusted for differences in purchasing power across countries. And uh, here you've got mean life satisfaction um, according to their studies. And so you, you can see that there's, there's a pretty definite um, correlation between the two. Let's look next at, at this idea that capitalism destroys the environment. I've got a whole talk later in the week on the environment. Uh, I think that's actually tomorrow on the environment. And uh, so I'll leave most of that for tomorrow. But um, Mises in his book, The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality, says, you know, you really can't dismiss a, a market-oriented country as uh, being ugly. Um, there's a lot of... Um, a mockery made of, of uh, strip malls and fast food restaurants and all of this kind of thing. But, um, and, and we, we personally, I prefer a mountain view to looking at a McDonald's sign, unless I'm hungry. Uh, most of us really enjoy the view of a McDonald's sign if that's what we want. And so what markets have done is they have catered to those, those needs. If you compare the uh, sort of urban sprawl kinds of things that, that are criticized to um, countries that are more, uh, where the government has more intervention into the economy, you get something that I, you know, beauty is subjective. We understand that. I, I look at this and I do not see beauty. I, you may. Subjective value and all that. I, nevertheless. Um, these are those uh, kind of uh, Soviet bloc apartment buildings that were thrown up in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, we'll talk later in my, my other uh, talk about the uh, environment on the BP oil spill. I, I don't really have time now to go into this. Uh, I will point out uh, in more detail tomorrow that government incentives created the kind of um, environment in which a uh, company could ignore the impact that they might have on, uh, on bystanders. So we'll, we'll talk about that some more. Um, fourth on my list uh, of five is this idea that capitalism is racist and sexist. Uh, there's a lot here. I will, since I am short on time, I will simply point you to a couple of articles on this. Uh, one is called the, the Enemies of Jim Crow by Jeff Jacoby. Uh, I think that was posted on Cafe Hayek a while back. And uh, George Leaf has an article, which I think is on Mises.org, called The Economics and Politics of Discrimination. Uh, Jacoby says in his article, to summarize, that if you're a streetcar owner uh, and you want to move people around and get paid for doing so, you don't want empty seats. A good way to get empty seats is to classify the seats according to a person's race and say, well, these seats are for African Americans and these seats are for white people. And if you do that, then you're foregoing income. An overriding concern of most for-profit businesses is profit. So you're not going to want to forego revenue and have empty seats on your streetcar by creating this kind of distinction on something other than their ability to pay for the seat. So segregation ended up hurting the bottom line of streetcar owners. Uh, the manager of Houston's streetcar company complained to city councilors in 1904 that to haul around, this is a quotation, to haul around a good deal of empty space that is assigned to the colored people and not available to both races, end quote, is, uh, is, is not good for his, his firm. Uh, uh, in, a, in a study published in the Journal of Economic History, Jennifer Roback, an economist, showed that in one southern city after another, private transit companies tried to scuttle segregation laws or simply ignored them. And there is more on that as well. Then there is this argument that capitalism produces the wrong stuff. I had a longer headline, something like capitalism doesn't produce the right stuff and produces too much of the wrong stuff, but you've seen this before too. 
Um, who, who's gonna do the space exploration? Some projects are simply too big for the market, that kind of thing. Um, what we actually see is that innovation, technological innovation, even the, maybe especially the, their very um, significant forms of innovation are hindered by government intervention rather than improved. The Wright brothers wrote to the U.S. government saying, we have an invention here and we, you, you could use it for, for scouting in the army, for message carrying and so forth. They got a form letter back in response. Their competitor, who was heavily funded by the U.S. government to the tune of something like $50,000, which is a lot of money at the time, um, their competitor ended in utter failure. This is the competitor's plane about to crash into the Potomac River, uh, nearly drowning the test pilot. Uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright were entirely self-funded, spent around $1,000 on materials and travel during their research. Um, as you know, if you've read any of Mises um, and, and a number of other authors uh, um, following him, there's this serious calculation problem that governments face. How do they measure the costs and benefits of various um, projects? Um, uh, the space shuttle, a classic example of something that was... Um, extremely expensive compared to initial projections. The projection was it's going to cost $118 per pound to get stuff into orbit. The actual cost, $27,000 per pound. Uh, they projected we're just going to be able to have a flight every few weeks because we're going to land this thing, we're going to set it back up on the launch pad and take off again uh, a few weeks, and what they actually found is every time they fly, they're going to have to overhaul the thing for many months at a cost of one and a half billion dollars every time. Then on the other side, you get, well, capitalism produces too many uh, bad things. Um, I will point you to Walter Block's two books on this, uh, Defending the Undefendable, and then he's got a kind of a volume two on that as well. Um, if you, let, let's suppose that for whatever reason you think um, that people should not use certain kinds of recreational drugs. Um, there are, first of all, there are ways to, to tackle what you see as a problem by trying to persuade people not to use recreational drugs. So I try to, I try to persuade my children not to use recreational drugs. Um, I think most parents would. Um, but I do, I, I, if you are using that same technique um, with, with children, you have more control with adults, uh, you need to use persuasion. Um, when you try to introduce coercion into that problem, uh, you end up with all kinds of, of uh, side effects that you didn't intend. The drugs get more powerful, they get more dangerous. Uh, crime is associated, um, violence is associated with the buying and selling of these substances and so forth. So Mises says, certainly there are many people who smoke too much and who smoke in spite of the fact it would be better for them not to smoke. He says, this raises a question which goes far beyond economic discussion. It shows what freedom really means. So the capitalistic system can be abused. It, can, it is abused by some people. It's certainly possible to do things which ought not to be done. But Mises says, a disapproving person always has a way to attempt to change the minds of his fellow citizens. He can try to, pers try to persuade them, to convince them, but he may not try to force them by the use of power, by the use of governmental police power. I have just a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you very much for your time.